of child deaths, infant mortality is attributed to malnutrition. So that's the kind of figure that we are talking about. And our child malnutrition rate at 46% is double that of sub-Saharan Africa, double that of some of the poorest countries in the world. So it's, it's something that's completely, completely not acceptable. And what's worse is that we've not been able to change this. If you look at the National Family Health Survey data, in 1999, uh, we had a child malnutrition rate of 47%, and today we have a child in 2006, and just 3 we have a child malnutrition rate of 46%. And that's a 1% reduction over six years of averaging 7, now, 7, 7 plus percentage uh, rate of GDP growth. So somehow there seems to be a link, you know, where, uh, and this uh, rate has come down from 92 onwards. So there seems to be a link between our social sector indicators and even if you compare it in our neighborhood, and the fact that, uh, you know, our economy transition, uh, the philosophical underpinning of our economy where, you know, there was a transition from self-reliance to reliance. And if you look at any indicator and compare it with our neighborhood, I mean, forget Sri Lanka, which has always done better than uh, India and indeed much of the developing world. Even Bangladesh uh, has overtaken us on virtually every single social sector indicator. And there's an excellent piece by Master Sen, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, where he has revisited the earlier work uh, with Drez on the India Bangladesh comparison in the New York Review of Books, where he's compared India Bangladesh and China recently. And you know, just to make this argument, if it needs to be made, that growth is not enough. If you take a low birth weight, how many babies in India are born low birth weight? Uh, and you compare that to Africa, the African average, which means a large number of countries in Africa are actually doing better than this. The average for all of Africa is 15%. 15% of all babies in Africa are born low birth weight. And that's a very critical indicator because it non not only has a bearing on the nutrition status of the child from that day onwards, but it is also a very good indicator of maternal health. Uh, which is again a proxy indicator for a number of other things. The low birth weight ratio of India is 30%. It's double that of, uh, of uh, the Af African average. And that's why I say that it's uh, it's tragic that not enough is being said, written, uh, spoken about, debated and discussed in parliament, in outside, in, in civil society, in, uh, uh, in the media on this issue. India ranks 65 out of 88 countries in the Global Hunger Index. 16 Indian states are doing worse than countries in sub-Saharan Africa in the Global Hunger Index, which takes just three very elegant, simple <coughs> indicators for which uniform data is available in these 88 countries, and that's infant mortality, uh, child mortality below the age of five, uh, percentage of population consuming less than 1,800 calories, which is the FEO norm, uh, and which is, of course, lower than the uh, RDA that we have in this country, which is 2,400 and 2,200, depending on rural or urban. And thirdly, uh, it looks at uh, the child malnutrition rates. Now, based on just these three indicators, we rank the 80th uh, or so country in India 65. We right there at the, uh, at the very bottom. What makes this uh, far more tragic, and of course, these are numbers. The numbers don't mean anything. My job, uh, uh, I work uh, in a commission which has been appointed by the Supreme Court to monitor all the food and employment schemes of the government as part of the right to food case that I'll come to in a bit. So, uh, I mean, I'm basically a clerk. I write letters, I write reports, I go with the cases. But what I find is that, you know, you get deeply insensitive about the numbers because when you say there's a child management rate of 46%, uh, and of course, all malnutrition is not contingent on food, even if one accepts that. But the fact of the matter is that a very large percentage of mothers in this country, the hardest lesson that they're teaching their children is a lesson of how to live with hunger. And it's a very, very cruel lesson to uh, teach. And when uh, and the toughest part of our jobs is, of course, to do these starvation death investigations. Because on one side, you have an uncaring state that says there's no starvation death. It's, you know, we did a post-mortem and we found a, a mango kernel uh, still in the stomach, so it's not starvation. And you talk to mothers and you see how they are coping. If it's a slightly older child, they just beat the child till it seems uh, lulls. Or if it's a very young child, as this group of Musa women, when they were talking to us, they started weeping. And they said, you know, if it's a very young child, we can't beat it, so we just take a pinch of tobacco and put it in the 
or you know, the underlip of the child's mother, then the child sleeps. So there is a tragedy behind these numbers, and I think somewhere we've got desensitized completely to the human dimension of uh, what hunger and malnutrition are doing in our, in our own spheres. What enhances this tragedy, in my view, is the fact that uh, we have a problem of plenty. That in 2001, the situation that we were in is exactly the same situation that we are in today, where government is holding on to close to 66 million metric tons. That was how much procurement we had, food stocks. And today we are at about 65.4 million metric tons. That's uh, close to six and a half pro tons of food. And if you want to estimate how much that means, uh, Jean had done this calculation for us in the early days of the right to food campaign, where uh, you know we said that if you line up one bag, uh, put them next to each other, uh, you can reach up to the moon and come come down halfway. Uh, that's a kind of food thing. Uh, yeah, all the way, all the way. Which is six million metric tons. I stand corrected. Now that's that's what we are holding on. The policy response between 2002 and 2005 was very simple, and those were years of extreme drought and hardship and a lot of starvation reports across the country. The policy response was to export out close to 30 million metric tons of food, which is an option that we are exploring once again in 2010, uh, even as I, in 2011, even as I speak. And not just that, the exports last time round will happen if they happen today under exactly the same conditions that they happened between 2002 and 2004, which is that government will give the exporter a subsidy to export out the grain because the international rate of wheat today is lower than the rate at which wheat is offered under BPL prices to people in India. And this was how we this is the rate at which we exported 30 million metric tons. And the story of that exports, as many of you know, is that the exporters were smart. They never exported it. They just consumed the subsidies, showed fake papers to show that the grain had moved out. The matter has been investigated by the CBI for the last five years. But I can reassure you that uh, nobody is going to go to jail on this because every single political party across uh, was, was involved in this. And we are going to make that same mistake again. This is when in 2001, uh, People's Union for Civil Liberties uh, went to the Supreme Court and, and filed this case which is now known as the Right to Food case. It's technically a civil right petition 196 of 2001. And they made a few very fundamental arguments. I mean, they went only for the state of Rajasthan because Brussels was most active there. Rajasthan, the Akal Mukti uh, 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 Samiti was there. And of course, the has written in detail in PW on this, the entire uh, mood of the place then, and what happened to that movement. And they had a very simple thing that, look, you have to go down the overflow in the food stores, which is what we are saying today in 2011, yet again to the Supreme Court. Please release these food stocks and not give them free, which is what we are demanding today. But increase the number of days that you're giving under the National Food for World Program, which is predominant there. This is one of the main demands. And, and so on. And there was a series of demands linked to this. And at that point in time, there was when it went to court, uh, when the court looked at all these figures, so moved to the Supreme Court, which uh, was under pressure, if one is cynical, to redeem its uh, public image in view of the Ramadan judgment that had just been given, decided to uh, extend this case across the country and say that all state governments, all central governments, food corporation of India, everybody is a respondent. We want answers to why it's, uh, things are not going the way they're doing. And this case then led to the universalization of uh, the integrated child development services. Uh, Supreme Court orders led to the universalization of the midday meal program under great resistance from the Supreme uh, from the government, both state and central. But fortunately, uh, these programs did get universalized. It led to increase in uh, the coverage as well as the amount that was being offered. Uh, for old age pensions, and it led to a series of reforms in different se sectors. And now the court has begun to address uh, different aspects of uh, uh, the public distribution system, the issue of urban homeless, and so on. And in fact, the four pressing issues which the court has been looking at over the last two years, one has been on the issue of working food grain, uh, and directing the government, which you, of course, must be encountering in the media from time to time, and why don't you give it at subsidized rates? Four months ago, we got an order that at least in the 150 poorest districts of the country, the Supreme Court ordered that please give them this grain away. 
and we don't want to tell you give it free. Give it at BPL rates, give it at AAY rates, but please give it to people. It's a burden on our conscience because your own affidavits are reflecting that such a large quantity of food bin is either getting destroyed or is in the verge of getting destroyed because it's stored out in the open and so on. Four months have passed since the order came. Not a single grain has been transferred because there is immense bureaucratic filibuster. So much so that Jhoi and Ritika brought to our notice a case of a man who was who, a casual laborer, W, uh, from Latihar in Jharkhand, who fell off his roof, became disabled six months ago, and been struggling to get a car. And I have personally intervened with the district collector. And now I learned that firstly they didn't give him an AY card, they gave him a BPL card. And to get his first rations, he had to sell his matka. Uh, you know, so tragic. It's, it's bizarre. And not only that, because they had to give him a car and there is a planning commission imposed cap, the district administration, because they were under a lot of pressure from us and thought that, you know, they might raise it in court or write to us, they actually knocked off somebody else's car first and then issued that car in this chance name. So that is the level of insensitivity that we are dealing with. The second issue that the court is obsessed with now, which again government is trying to stall, is on the issue of cap. And the court is asking a very simple question. They're saying you are doing a BPL <coughs> survey. Now, to ask a survey means the enumeration to find out how many people exist or are eligible for X, Y, or Z. How can you do a survey where you are telling the state government that you can do a survey and identify a poor so long as your poor are restricted to X number? And in the opinion of the court, as Justice Mandari put it very eloquently, he said, when you got the census done, uh, Mr. Solicitor General, did you tell the RGI that do a census but the number should not exceed 1.2 billion? So therefore, you should not have a poverty cap. And it's a very simple thing, but extremely hard for government to understand. The second thing the court is saying is, even if you do have a cap, how can you keep a cap that settles at a per capita per day expenditure level, at 2004-05 prices at rupees <coughs> 20 urban areas, which incidentally is a Tendulkar estimate. That how can you say in today that even if you extend this 20 rupees and we'll be able to do that once the NSSO unit level data is there for the last round, but even if you just apply CPI uh, for urban areas, say for urban, in Delhi it will come to about 30 rupees. That 30 rupees per capita per day expenditure, if you're spending 31 rupees, you are out. You know, so there is this question that the court has been asking and the matter was to be heard on the 18th, but it's now got postponed by a couple of weeks. The third thing, of course, that the court is fussing about now is the computerization of the public distribution system and the reforms in the PDS and driving a, and micromanaging a lot of it, which in my opinion, frankly, is not what it should do, but be that as it may, they're doing it. Because they are also worried about the criticism that they are receiving uh, because of, in the media for the PDS not working. And lastly, of course, uh, the very remarkable thing that the court has done over the last two years is to uh, force governments to set up shelters for homeless people. What started as one case in Delhi has now led to the creation of about two and a half to three thousand shelters, permanent 24 hour shelters for urban homeless people in all towns, 64 towns covered under JNM and URM, and uh, now being increased about roughly about 350 towns the country where you have shelters at a ratio of 1 is to 100,000. And these shelters are coming up, money is being allotted, facilities are being provided, states are competing with each other to give free food and facility in the shelter for urban homeless people. Now, that's where the case was. And three years ago, during the time of the last elections, the right to campaign, which has spearheaded this entire thing, uh, they decided that it may be a good idea to legislate get this legislated in the tradition that the NREG was legislated in the tradition that the RTI was legislated or the right to education was uh, legislated that the right to food should also be legislated I and mean, it was not something that was debated and discussed but there were many people in the campaign who spoke to political parties and everybody thought that okay this is a reasonable idea and there were four or five reasons why the political class cutting across party lines with the exception of CPM uh, which said that they couldn't include it in the manifesto because the central committee has not approved it and so and so and you know they gave some <coughs> elaborate reason of why it could not be part of the manifesto but most political parties the bjp the congress uh, uh, primarily agreed uh, and the smaller parties had decided to support this when we went and spoke to them and and you know it's interesting to see why the political class responded positively to the suggestion that you should legislate the right to food as fundamental right if you were to come back to power 
I think one reason is of course the moral imperative that you know how much ever we may like to think otherwise, even neoliberals have feelings that there is a feeling of deep embarrassment that India's nutrition indicators invoke in any international forum because the second fastest growing economy, wanting to occupy the high table everywhere. But every forum somebody or the other points out your uh, you know your standing in the human development index or the global hunger index or on child malnutrition or on maternal mortality, it's an embarrassment for them. And therefore people know that look, here's a chance maybe we can do something about it. The second reason, uh, which is intensely political, is that today government is spending about 100,000 crores on different food schemes. And all of these are subjudice in the Supreme Court, where the court has ordered that no change can be made in any of these programs without the explicit permission, either an order from the court or explicit permission from the office of the Supreme Court commissioners. So government is spending 100,000 crores, but they are completely constrained by this. And of course, there is a larger democratic argument that after all, this detail of policy and the intervention of at this level by the Supreme Court on what children should eat, how many calories, how many proteins, how that food should be made, the cook help of that, the caste of the cook, uh, who's going to cook that food, and whether they can be private contractors or not, all this is being decided on a day-to-day -day basis literally by the Supreme Court. And there's a logic that you know if the political class is to seize it back for the legislature and the executive where it belongs, it's a great idea to legislate this because then it comes out of the ambit of the courts, or so they hope. And thirdly, and I risk saying this in the presence of Yogi and Bhai, I think somewhere there was a calculation that in the last elections in most of the states where the anti-incumbency factor was broken, uh, the common feature, but for Delhi and maybe Bihar, was the fact that these states where the anti-incumbency factor was broken, uh, cutting across party lines, had, I, had done two of these things, either of them or both. One is throw away the planning commission's poverty cap in the dustbin and universalize or quasi universalize. And two, have a, a program for cheap food, one, two, three rupees, or promises of cheap food. And cutting across party lines that was the experience. So perhaps there was a feeling that look what's happening in South India could be replicated in the North as well. So they agreed. Now when they agreed to this proposal in the Congress, the UPA put it in its manifesto. Uh, there were five expectations that the right to food campaign or people like us had uh, who were working with this campaign. First, that you know, the, when you legislate a right, you want to go a little beyond, if not way beyond, then what you already have. That if the Supreme Court has, by its orders, created these as legal entitlements and said that any violation of these entitlements is tantamount to a contempt of court. Government would legislate a bit more. So they have created a range of entitlements from children to, uh, you know, from the cradle to way after your death. There is some scheme or the other covering you, which is part of the right to food case. And all of these have been defined as legal entitlements. So we expect the government to go away beyond. Or at least firm them up as rights. The second expectation was to reform existing programs because some of these programs, despite our affection for them, are deeply flawed. Uh, and there's no point being fundamentalist about it. The PDS, for instance, is deeply flawed because it is so targeted. The ICDS is deeply flawed, which is the integrated child development services, because much of the malnutrition happens below the age of two, and the entire focus of the ICDS is almost on the child in the age group of three to six. So here was an opportunity for you to reform existing programs to make them work better. The, yeah. the third was to focus on nutrition rather than food. Uh, so we thought that, look, here's an opportunity where we stop obsessing about food because nutrition is a capability that's contingent on water, sanitation, access to health care, which food is not. And therefore, here's an opportunity to uh, extend that and look at these issues as well. And lastly, to look at food security as a larger continuum, which it, uh, you know, look at the agrarian crisis, uh, look at what is happening in agriculture, take, create some enabling framework for all of this to happen, and tie all, all this up in a nuanced aggressive mechanism that works. With the formation of the National Advisory Council, we thought that okay, now things are going to go in a positive way. But I must say that uh, due to the complete lack of vision of many of our colleagues in the National Advisory Council and the inability to negotiate the state, we ended up with the NAC draft, which was waiver, which not only did not meet any of these expectations except on Vivan's addressing, but came up with such confusing formulations that most newspapers got it wrong when it was announced. Hindu actually was the only paper which published an apology uh, saying that we were wrong. Uh, 
most of the other papers are carried on with the canard that 75% of people are going to get subsidized food. Because the formulation the government has come up with is that 44% of rural India and 28% of urban India will, will get 35 kilos of food in at 3, 2 or 1, depending on whether it's rice, wheat or millets. 22% of urban India and 46% of rural India, this is any formulation, will get 25 kilos of food grains at 50% of the MSP. Now, I bet that none of you who are not familiar with the debate can even repeat this formulation. It was so goddamn complicated. And it was compromised and compromised and compromised due to the lack of vision and due to the fact that they chose to negotiate. I mean, it was almost as if the National Advisory Council is now going to produce a bill which is, uh, which is going to give us the right to cross the road when the traffic signal is green. Their approach to food security was flawed, minimalistic, did not take factor in nutrition, and so on. So we had a bad, very bad round which just to be negotiated with government. What the government has come up is uh, even worse. I mean, just when we thought that, look, it can't get any worse than this. In fact, they've now come up with a draft, and I think, uh, which basically is such a bad deal, and it sets us back so much from the directive principles that it is better not to have this draft go through parliament than to have. It is better not to legislate the right to food than to do it in the manner in which the government is choosing to do it. Uh, they've further reduced the NAC entitlements. 50% of urban India is going to be excluded, and almost 25% of rural India is going to be completely excluded from the provisions of this act. Second, they are not, uh, the PDS uh, is, Should there is no reform. Of those which were included by <laughs> no, NAC, 50% of overall, urban India 50% is off. Second, no view, no perspective on nutrition security. Even the minimalistic programs that the NAC had put in like a maternity entitlement, which would deal with the issues of low birth rate and other issues that I spoke about, have been knocked off. A huge push for cash now. The only concession that the additional secretary wrote the draft, he was reassuring me last week that in the nth version of the draft, he said, I pushed cash transfer from the main draft to the schedule to accommodate your concerns. But there is a huge push. In fact, the, one of the first steps that states must undertake to reform their PTS was to wind it down and start cash transfer. This is the text of the government. Introduce all such measures necessary, including replacing food trains with cash and replacing the PTS. So PDS reform means shut it down. And lastly, the only saving grace, if you can call it that, was the grievance redressal mechanism uh, proposed by the NAC. Uh, that has been molested uh, beyond recognition now. I mean, it has been, I mean, the spirit of it, because it's been cleverly done. So the structures that the NAC proposed have been retained, but the composition has been changed. So where NAC spoke about members being independently chosen or being of a certain level and so on, the government now maintains the structure but says that in this nuanced federal system which goes from the block level to the national level, <coughs> any serving officer of government, irrespective of rank, whether from the state service or from any other central or state service, can become a member of this mechanism. Which means that you can have the apex body that is going to judge uh, panel judgment uh, or, or, on each of these issues and check for compliance which can be headed by one undersecretary of government of India from ICDS or any food scheme and have four deputy secretaries or whatever. That is what they have done to previous redressal uh, in a sense. And therefore, friends, I feel that uh, uh, we are already too late in the discussion. Uh, the bill is going to be given, this is going to go to cabinet once the comments from the, uh, from the states come in. And unless they redesign it completely because of feedback from the states, which I would be surprised with, most states are slamming the center for coming up with the act which increases their liability but does not give them corresponding right to increase their programs. Uh, this bill is going to go to the standing committee. And of course, I believe in, that we must continue engaging with the standing committee and we must try and change the draft and contours of this bill uh, because it would make ineffective the entire mechanism that we have started and built over the years. It would completely destroy the right to food campaign in a sense because uh, this is something that the campaign had pushed for. This was an example of proactive engagement if it already hasn't done that, uh, if I may say. Uh, and you know, people who who've championed this bill will have more egg on their face than they need for breakfast or the next one year. And it's 
it's going to be a mess. So I think it's all in all a uh, bad deal on uh, a no deal on this is better than such a bad deal with the government. I like your deal. Thank you.
a kind of a outcome of most of these things, including, I mean, this, for example, why it happens in India in your own, uh, and it's uh, uh, five kilos or whatever. Why can't we have in under prepared survey that families with children, non school going age children, must have a special nutrition bag? See, these are pragmatic things. I think this would not go up to theory ideology of Texas. And the, the, you know, the challenge is about really, I won't say even pragmatizing, but really sensitizing this policy process more.
Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the, the, the I mean, I, I was privileged to hear an exchange between Gaushik Basu and Jean Grace on the role of economics in India. And then Jean, who normally wouldn't talk about these professional concerns about economics as a discipline and things of that sort, I think got so, so agitated that he actually gave Gaushik Basu a lecture for 10 minutes on how economic theory has destroyed and how economists should do anything else but not meddle with economy. Or <laughs> because please don't meddle with economy. You're very smart, you're good at economic theory, please go and practice your model. Don't meddle with this. And he gave reasons why economists must not meddle with economy. And I think this is the heart of the matter when we once that our understanding of the relationship between politics and economy is still so determined by models which we picked up from outside. And uh, we really need to develop our own models of why this thing which is so self actually does not happen. Uh, uh, you do <coughs> document on this nutrition aspect and share it.
problematic uh, as one looks at this whole scenario is that on the surface, what is being presented is this whole impression of you know, increasing, expanding you know, state action, welfare, uh, penetration by the state, you know, sta the state kind of care and concern, whereas actually uh, uh, what's happening is on the ground that the state is really you know, investing far more in those who are really capable for caring for themselves, rather than for, you know, uh, as, as contrasted with those who really need care. And, uh, and this whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, this whole thing that you brought out about the crucial thing about zero to two years, and uh, this, and, and the umbilical, and I stress the word umbilical, because, you know, uh, a connection between maternal and infant mortality. Because that has to be, you know, sustained uh, post-birth. No, in, uh, no. And I think both the PDS, uh, and I don't know enough about this, uh, and maybe you could, uh, uh, you know, perhaps suggest, uh, perhaps for light on whether PDS actually takes care of this, but both the PDS and food security, uh, you know, whatever uh, legislation is going to come out, need to actually, uh, you know, take care of this crucial relationship between infant stroke uh, uh, maternal uh, you know, nutrition. And, um, and I believe in the, in the, uh, in the new draft, uh, there, uh, in, uh, there was a provision uh, in the government draft, uh, in the NAC uh, there was a provision for rupees 1,000 per, per month for six months, and I believe that that has also been then withdrawn. Yeah. And I think that they've also further, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, dramatic problems with the government draft. I mean, uh, the fact that it's going to be, um, again, go back to the planning commission norm of rupees 30 per day. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the kind of ways in which it's, the household in which it's going to be limited to. Also, that the coverage will actually shrink as official poverty estimates are revised. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the further problem is also that uh, the schedule of priority groups, um, you know, can be can be modified without the parliament without parliament's approval, and just you know, kind of government fear can actually uh, can actually do this. And and further, I think what's also significant is what's been modified in, in the kind of uh, transition from the NAC to the government draft is the way in which um, you know. Uh, starvation deaths and community kitchens, uh, which were uh, part of uh, the NAC draft, I'm told, uh, that's also been modified by, by the government, by the government draft. So I think those are also very, very crucial uh, things um, uh, and limits with respect to uh, the current draft. You know, I think that somewhere there needs to be much greater, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, Ritu and uh, Vijay Pratapji are here and they've been working on this whole question of hunger and uh, as well, but uh, whether there's actually been enough concerted public effort to really, uh, you know, and I, I would like both of you to also reflect on that. Before and then, then we will make the question as well. Then we will present that question. Because in that context, I just have a small uh, observation about, you know, about uh, the the some of those uh, uh, the, the BPL uh, the BPL category is, is extremely fluid in India. Uh, somehow we felt that you know in, in last year, in early last year or, uh, or year before, there were there were flash floods in Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. And in one night, I think about fifty percent people in about two hundred villages became uh, APL to BPL in about six hours. In the morning when you wake up, you actually realize that you are BPL. And uh, the first draft at that time, when we looked at the draft, we saw that the uh, category would be frozen for five years. And for that, yeah. So if, if you are if you are APL and uh, suddenly you realize the next morning when you wake up that you are actually BPL, there is no way that you can go to one particular department and say that you know, 
and then we were uh, also talking to many other activists in the villages and we were told that this is not a great observation because this is something that they've been feeling for a long time. They say one sickness in the family and you could have been here. They said, uh, you know, one back to back two droughts and you have entire village becoming here. They were coming to normally believe that about 10, 50 percent people are not people, but that also happens. That in fact, there are states where back to back droughts are, uh, droughts are very, very common. I have a, a question each for you. Basically, there is this argument of rain fed agriculture, the dry land agriculture, where we say that we, uh, you know, instead of water guzzling uh, crops like hybrid wheat and, and rice, we go for millets, you know, ragi, legumes, uh, and few pulses, you know, more than this. And uh, one, you actually save water, and second, you also are able to give nutritious cereals to people. Now that we have two very big consumers of uh, grain in India, one is the vitamin scheme, where quite easily I think the nutritious food can be given, and the other is right to food. So I, mean, I, I want to know your views, how can this go into you? Decentralized PDS procurement, or I mean, how can one go about it? Or is it worth I mean, pursuing? And second, I have a question of Dhiruva. I, I know that you know, I, mean, I want you to expand on what you said on the ideology part. No, a little, I mean, I, I have a very, very pointed question. That I mean, what we see as outsiders is that almost a foregone conclusion that there is only one ideology, which is market. Between the well, main opposition parties, except the uh, you know communist parties, it's like everybody seems to believe that you know this is going to work, and uh, you know it's almost no, like the communist parties. Sure, I feel that by their and not by what they like. So I just take the question as a civil code. Now, firstly, on this uh, million metric ton business in what is it mean? Look, our total production is about 230 million over three times, surprisingly. Government procures, on average, over the last few four years, to get it, about 50 to 55 million metric ton of food, uh, of which some of it is a buffer stock and some of it is distributed to various different programs. At any point in time, the buffer stock requirement of what is known as the buffer and strategic reserve norm. It varies between 22 to 24 and a half million. What is what is happening now, and what happened in 2001, is government is holding on to three times the buffer stock, and that is a problem, and that is really a problem. And now, why is government doing that? What is the what is the thinking behind this? Now, government one is that it is completely not in favor of expanding the PDS in any region, and on this there is a consensus across. Ministries with the Planning Commission, with Pranam Mukherjee, with Chitandra. There is that we cannot allow it. If you, okay, we have a problem now on our hands, but if we expand it, we'll have a bigger problem on our hands later. So we can't do it. Second, uh, because of the relentless pressure of the Supreme Court, government is allocating grain to the states, but at rates which are not remunerated enough for the states to pick up. Which means that suppose I am Food Secretary of Orissa. Government today, of course, they started off by saying that you know take as much as you want at market rate, economic cost. Then they brought it down to APL. Then nothing zero off. Then they're now saying BPL, take as much as you want. But if I am the secretary of Orissa, my finance secretary will not allow me to live that grain at six rupees fifteen pesa because I have to distribute it at two rupees. So the differential between what the center is offering in the state that's not happening. And the second reason is states know that it's an ad hoc measure. What we have been arguing in 2011 you are allocating food grains to the state based on the 1991 census, the projection for 2001, uh, for 1999. You're using the 91 census as projection of 99 to decide in 2011 how much